can give people a few more minutes to roll in, but I want to make sure you guys can hear me okay. Uh, if somebody would just say something before we get started. Sound good? Yes, no, maybe. Sweet. Thanks, Adam. I'll give a few people a few more minutes to get in here and we'll get rolling in a minute or so. I can try and answer questions like as I'm tying, uh, feel free to ask anything um, and I'll try and get to it. Uh, if I miss it, I'll try and scroll back through at the end uh, and answer any questions you guys have. Um, yeah, uh, I'll go ahead and get started. It's eight o'clock on my watch. Uh, so my name is Matt Bennett. Uh, I own and operate Fly Geek Custom Flies. I live in Austin, Texas. Um, I do most of my fishing kind of here locally, so I do a lot of warm water fishing for bass and sunfish and uh, things like that. So I'm gonna tie a few patterns, a few of my favorites for those fish. Um, doesn't mean they won't work elsewhere. Uh, I take several trips to the Rockies usually every year. Uh, so I fish a lot of these flies for trout as well and in the, in the salt water when I get down there also. So. Um, the first one I'm going to do here is the one that I already have in the vise. It's the lunch money. It's kind of my signature pattern. Uh, it's kind of a bite size streamer. I'm going to do a size two. So this is about the biggest one that I tie. Um, this is kind of the tan and white color, the color I fish the most. So I'm going to roll through this one. I have a, a cart pattern and I have kind of a pan fish and a small bass kind of nymph that I'm going to tie, uh, so we'll roll through all those. Um, this is gonna be on an Arex NS172 or 122, I can't remember. It's their light stinger hook. Um, you can sub in a Gamakatsu B10S as well. Um, it makes a pretty good substitute. So again, this is size two. Uh, I'm tying with 140 Vivas Power Thread. I'm gonna start right behind, kind of an eye length back and just make a little thread bump there. I'm using, these are hairline uh, double pupil eyes in a size medium. I'm gonna tie these on the top of the hook. And yeah, I give them about eight wraps one way, kind of twist them straight. And about eight wraps the other way. And then I'll go over and just do these crossing wraps eight or so of those and then to secure them down what I'll do is go over the hook shank and then underneath the eye I'll do these kind of cross wraps underneath to get those nice and set and then pull fairly tightly and you can add some super glue or something if you want to I don't usually bother with that um, they're still fairly secure here so uh, now that our eyes are good to go I'm gonna wrap a thread base here back and I always try and find a pretty consistent stopping point uh, so usually my stopping point is going to be right here uh, between the barb and the hook point um, so that's typically where I'm going to start this fly every time um, the tail on the fly I use these uh, groovy bunny zonkers or regular zonkers from hairline uh, these groovy ones are kind of cool because they're barred and kind of uh, tie dyed um, so you can use whatever you have. Um, I will tell you a little tip. So I buy, I go through a lot of zonkers. So what I do is go through and put them on a safety pin like this um, and just leave them kind of on a hanger overnight with like a bulldog clip or a binder clip or something like that, just holding them straight up. And that way, when you get them out of the package, you know, they're kind of all crinkled up. Um, this will help straighten those out. Um, if you just leave them hanging up somewhere over a couple of nights, they'll straighten out nice and you won't have like kinks in the skin side or anything like that. So 
We're gonna measure our tail. I always measure it with the skin side uh, because the hair side, you know, it being a natural material, some of this is longer than the other. So I just measure it with the skin side and I want it to be a hook shank and a little bit extra. So um, usually about one and a quarter hook shank. That's about, I want the tail to be about that long, something like that. What I'm gonna do is take this and poke the hook through its skin side first and take it out of the vise just kind of pop it all the way through kind of get that hair out of the way put it back in the vise and then flip it over and that's how we're going to do our tail just like that so to separate the hair from the hide here find us a pretty good tie-in spot I'm going to try and do this without hitting my camera. This is like my one little party trick. So because I am a production tire, I try to get a lot of tie flies tied um, whenever I sit down and kind of have a tying session. So every little bit of speed kind of helps me. So to all that I do to tie this down is you just give it a couple of flicks like that. Pull the front piece out of the way, pull it tight, wrap up to behind the eyes. And now we're going to take this piece here that's going to form our collar, kind of our transition. And we'll go usually two or three wraps. I'm going to do three on this one and kind of stroke these fibers back as I do it. And then same thing again. We're going to secure this down, separate our hair from our hide, and just flick it over just like that. And then come in with your scissors now and just cut that skin zonker side wrap over that tag in and that's going to form your base for the rest of the fly it also gives it that nice kind of taper um, kind of that bait fish uh, taper um, not only when you get it wet it's going to extend out kind of the sides like that um, and obviously top and bottom kind of that classic teardrop shape so we're going to add some legs just for some more motion and some accent color um, these are also from Hairline. They're the Chacon uh, Crusher legs. This is the, the tan or uh, no, the sand clear color. Uh, and just the regular size. On the smaller sizes, I'll use the micro size. So I'm gonna pull off two of these legs and try and tie them on the side closest to you guys where you can see. But to kind of find the midpoint of those, set them right behind the eye pinch down like so give it two or three wraps and then this piece that's facing forward here we're going to take and pull to the side to the other side the side closest to me kind of hold those there and wrap back over them with your thread to lock those in and this is how i tie in most of my legs and other materials just because if you get a fish that comes in and tries to grab it by one side it's not going to be able to pull this whole leg out if you were to tie them in the middle one on each side so uh, that's the reason i do it that way and then i'll come in and cut the legs to be just a little bit shorter than the end of the tail itself to where it kind of tapers back kind of like that Uh, the rest of the fly is going to be all out of laser dub. Uh, it's just a synthetic kind of acrylic dubbing. Um, so I'm going to use, I've got some tan here. So I got a clump of tan, got a clump of white, and then I have a little bit of this kind of rusty bronze color that I'm going to use uh, as an accent. Uh, Mark's asking what color combo the rabbit strip is. This is the groovy bunny in the yellow tan barred white, I think is the name of the color. Um, I'm like 95% sure that's the right one. Uh, so to form the head, we're going to use laser dub. We come in and I'm just going to pick off a little bit, a clump about like that. Um, the trick with this fly is not to use too much of this stuff. Uh, a little bit goes a long way. So what I'm gonna actually do here is just take it and kind of re-align those fibers in my hand. Uh, kind of get them all going the same way. And then I'll come in and pull out some of these longer fibers on one side, pull out these longer ones on the other side. 
and just get rid of those. So now we have a nice kind of uniform length with a little bit of taper on the end clump. I'm going to try and separate that into two fairly even pieces like that. I'm going to take them and hold them and pinch them with my right hand and kind of make a V like that. And I'm going to stick the head of the fly into the V. Kind of switch hands to hold it there. And then with just some real soft wraps, because you don't want to do it, uh, you don't want to come over with a lot of force, but just real soft pinch wraps, about three of those, pull tight. And then take these front facing pieces and just kind of stroke those back. Watch out for the hook point. Uh, I impale myself on a hook point pretty regularly doing this fly. Then make a little thread dam in the front like so. Um, and that kind of keeps that back. And that's your first kind of collar that goes all the way around. Uh, so the next we're going to start doing a two-tone body. So we're going to start doing top and bottom different colors. So I'm going to come in with some tan now. About the same amount. Same idea. Come in and kind of straighten these fibers. You can restack them or tear them however you want to do it. We're going to set those, because this fly ride took up, this is the top of the fly. Good again, going to find kind of that middle point, about like that. That's where we're going to tie it in. And usually what I'll do is very similar to the leg, so I'll put one side. I'll put it on the top of the hook, but on one side of the, the hook bend like that. Just hold it, pinch that down to where it's on the top of the, the fly here. And then this piece I'll take and fold around the other way like that and then come back and wrap over it with your thread like so and you can do it alternating ones like that or you can do one top one bottom and then push both of them back it's whatever you prefer to do uh, you'll get the kind of the same effect either way so now we're going to go with some white kind of the same idea right on the bottom at the midpoint pull that down and then take this piece and just fold it back over itself like so Make a little thread dam in front of that to keep those backwards. Uh, so I like to add a little bit of accent color to these. So I'll come in with this rusty bronze color now. Like so. Take just a little tiny piece of this stuff. You don't need a whole lot. Take a little bit of that and I kind of twist it to form kind of a cord. Like so. And I'm going to set it, I'm going to try and show you how to set it. I'm going to set it on the side again, closest to you. Man, I got laser up in my nose or something. Uh, so right at the right at the midpoint, I'm setting it right on top of the eyes on the close side to you. And again, I don't have very much. It's just a little bit. I'm going to take it, kind of pinch it there. Wrap over like that. And then I'm going to take this front facing piece here and go back on the other side like that. So now we have a little bit of this kind of gill accent color on both sides and that'll kind of show through here at the end. So I'm going to move my thread all the way up to the hook eye now like so and then come in with another clump of tan. Goes on the top of the fly right at the midpoint again. Set that on, kind of stroke that down. Make sure most of this stays on the top, kind of 180 degrees of the hook. And then more white for the bottom. Kind of restack this stuff, pull out your longer fibers. And then set that on the very bottom there. Now we're just gonna take this and kind of push it all back to expose that hook eye. And I just kind of hold it all back, kind of sneak my thread in there as best I can. Pull it down to cinch it down and then come back in with the whip finisher. Give it one or two pretty good whip finishes so it doesn't come up none. And this is, that's the basic fly, but we're going to do a few other things to it. You could fish it just like that, and it would fish pretty well. First thing I always do is come in with some UV resin or some head cement and just coat those thread wraps. Um, you know, if you're going to spend five or ten minutes tying a streamer, 
might as well make sure your thread wraps don't come undone. Usually with two good whip finishes on there, you're not going to have much of a problem, but uh, just to be on the safe side, it's good to go ahead and cure that up. I use like a real thin UV resin, um, like Loon or um, anything like that. That's typically what I'm using. So I'm going to come in and kind of do some marker work on this to make it kind of give it some stripes and some other color. Um, so I'm going to use a Prismacolor and a dark brown and just come in on the top. And it's easiest to mark on this if you hold it tight, like if you're just pulling back and putting tension on it and just come in and hit it with that marker and give it three or so bars on the top and kind of sides like that. Then I'll come in in between there with some yellow now and also on the bottom just coming in with a little bit of yellow for the throat and again this isn't imitating anything in particular it's just adds some nice accents of the fly this is more of one of the uh, kind of suggestive colors and and that I do and it, not necessarily an actual imitation of uh, a forage fish that we're looking at and then I came back with some yellow or some orange and just add the smallest little bit on that throat there and then the most important thing to do is come in now with a brush I just use like a uh, brass brush um, you could use like a gun cleaning brush I don't like the real heavy stainless steel brushes. Um, that'll start ripping some of the, the dubbing out. Uh, but anything like this or a uh, an old toothbrush, something like that, is, a, is a something good. So I just come in and you don't have to be easy with it. Just come in and start brushing it. And what this will do while that marker's still wet is kind of fade that barring a little bit. So if you want something that's more you know, definitive looking uh, to where it's got some heavier barring, then brush it first to get all the tangles out and then come in with your marker and do the marker work and you'll have some um, more distinct bars. But I like to kind of fade those colors a little bit, um, kind of help blend things into each other. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the basic lunch money in a tan. Um, I do probably, I don't know, like 20 different colors of this fly. So um, I'll show you a few that I do um, just kind of some different colors. So that's the tan and white. I mean, if I'm going to fish this probably 90% of the time, this is the one I'm going to throw on first. Um, so you're more kind of specific imitative colors. So there's your kind of your standard bluegill color. Um, here's the, I do a kind of a custom dubbing mix on this one to get kind of a clear water shad color. Um, this is kind of, you're venturing more into the conventional lure world color schemes here. So this is like a sexy shad it's called in the conventional world. And then everybody who fishes warm water knows about fire tiger. Um, so that's just a handful of colors that I do in this one. Um, I have a couple other ones sitting here too. So here's a olive and yellow kind of a good perch imitation if you have perch around where you fish um, and then this is just kind of a it's not really meant to be a crawfish fly but um, I do a crawfish color in it um, just to imitate stuff off the bottom um, so there's kind of a craw color um, Chris Fritz says five or ten minutes more like 15 to 30 for me well you know when you've tied like 10,000 of them hopefully <laughs> you're a little bit quicker than uh, when you first started out, right? Um, so I do these. I do uh, all black is a good one. Um, I'm trying to think what else that I have in my box. A lot of sculpting colors, like an olive or a brown sculpin. Um, you know, pink and white, I fish a good bit. Black and purple, stuff like that. So um, this is probably my number one fly that I'll fish for our bass here, but it also works. I fish it a lot for trout up in Colorado, and, um, you know, I have plenty of friends who throw them for redfish down on the coast, so it's a it's a pretty versatile pattern. You know, just about everything eats bait fish, so 
um, you know, don't be afraid to tie a few up and whatever colors you like the best and give them a shot. Um, let me know how you do with them. Uh, I'm going to put some of this stuff away and then we'll switch gears and do kind of a carp imitation that actually has some white feathers in it. The first one did not. Uh, I just wanted to show that one off because it's one of my favorite flies. Um, that pattern is available through Umqua, so you can find it in a few different colors and uh, in fly shops if you don't tie them yourself. Um, if you do tie them yourself and you have questions about them, don't uh, hesitate to reach out. Yes, yeah, Chris, it does work on the guad uh, pretty well. You know, and on the guad, a lot of times I'll take two. I'll take like a a lighter color like this tan and. I don't really have a darker color sitting here, but pretend this one's a little bit darker. And I'll fish, I'll actually fish both of them at the same time, probably about three or so feet apart um, on some pretty heavy tippet on a seven weight and just see what kind of response I get from the fish. And um, if I start catching fish on one color, I'll swap them both to that same color. Or I'll swap them both to dark or both to light or something like that. So um, something to try. Um, we're going to do another fly here for bass and carp called the carpet bomb next. Um, it's a great little pattern for carp and bass and everything like that. So that's what it looks like. I tie it in a bunch of different colors as well. Um, these are just using standard marabou, but we're going to tie, um, I'm going to use some soft tackle chickaboo on one here. Um, off of these uh, soft tackle chickaboo uh, spay pieces here that I like a lot. You get some really nice kind of flowy feathers with these. They move really well in the water. Um, so really good option for this. this. is just kind of a grizzly olive. So you do kind of this color but a grizzly olive. So let's see uh, how it turns out. Uh, same hook for this one as the lunch money, just a little bit smaller. So this is, again, an Eric light stinger and a size uh, six. Still using power thread. Uh, I use typically on my carp flies. I fish. Uh, I typically will use a brighter thread just to help be able to find it against the bottom. Most of the flies that I tie for carp and um, even when I'm sight fishing for bass tend to be. In this style, tend to be kind of the imitate the color of the bottom. Uh, that's what your dragonfly and damselfly nymphs are going to look like, or your crawfish. Um, they're always going to, not always, they're usually going to imitate kind of the bottom for camouflage. So um, this little hot spot of throw kind of helped me pick them out. We're going to tie this one eyes on the same way. You can tie them with heavy eyes. Uh, I actually use this is uh, just large bead chain um, and a black and tie these on the same way so 10 wraps one way 10 wraps the other way and then I'll kind of do these X wraps here help secure that make sure they're kind of straight and then over your hook underneath the eye just like that Just pull as tight as you can without breaking your thread and that kind of helps cinch those wraps underneath to where it helps keep that eye on and again you can come in with some super glue and kind of paint that if you'd like um, totally good so we're gonna need two pretty good feathers for this one maybe three let's see what we're working with so these these near the top especially are nice and fluffy so I'm gonna grab two of these off the back of this See how those look. Those are a little thin. That's so. That's that's typically what you want. Something nice, um, like that. And then these are two more that I pulled off. So actually, what I can do, since these are a little sparser, I'm going to use these for the wing and just use them both together like that. And you get pretty much one one feather like that. So we'll do it that way. So I'm going to take this tail here. I'm going to make my fluffier part of the tail. I'm going to measure it against the hook shank. I'm going to have it just be a little bit longer than the hook shank. So right at the edge of the bend of the hook there um, is where I'm going to uh, have my tail end up. I'm going to tie it down the shank a little bit. So about like that. 
I'm gonna pinch that there. Soft wrap to lock it in. Sometimes those feathers will fight you. Just give them a couple wraps to lock them in. Come back in with your scissors and trim off that section. And then just hold it kind of on the top, a little bit under tension so it stays in the proper place and wrap it down the bend of the hook like that. If you have a pretty hair, Haribu, wow. If you have a pretty heavy marabou feather with a with a heavy tip in it, what I'll come in and do is uh, I'll break off that tip or just cut it off just so it doesn't impede the, the motion of the fly. So that's our tail. Come back in with some silly legs here. My tripod was on my material bag. Sorry about that. So these are brown uh, barred root beer so legs from Hairline. I'm going to take one of these. I'm going to divide that in half best I can. Cut it in half once I've folded it over. Now I have kind of two legs, two shorter legs there. Oop, like that. I'm going to set these on the far side of the hook close to you guys, right in the middle as best I can. Kind of wrap over like that. Got those locked down now on the that edge of the hook. And I'm going to take this piece here, pull it over the top of the hook, and again, wrap back over it like so, just to lock those in. And then I'll kind of pull those tight and wrap back over it to where my tail started. Now I have two legs on either side of that marabou plume there. Let me cut in, come in and cut these to be just a little bit longer, right at the edge of that marabou feather, like so. So for the body of the fly, I use this, uh, this is Pat Cohen's uh, carp dub. It's really cool stuff. Um, it has these really tiny rubber legs kind of built into it. So you get a lot of motion from it. Uh, it's a really long fiber dubbing. So when you spin it up in the dubbing loop, like we're about to do, uh, it traps air really well. So when you bounce this thing along the bottom, you get these little air bubbles that kind of pop up. It looks pretty cool. So I'm going to do a split thread dubbing loop. Um, I really like this thread for this. You can see kind of right at the top here, maybe a little bit where the thread is already kind of flattened out. So you could absolutely come in with a bodkin and split this thread. You know, speed is kind of everything for me since I'm tying commercially. So I use this uh, Stanfo thread splitter and it's just a spring loaded thing with a little needle on the end. So if your thread's not already split, you just kind of stroke it down to flatten it out. And this only works with certain types of thread, like uh, uni thread doesn't split very well. Uh, you need like a multi-filament thread like Ultra or Vivas uh, Power Thread. Regular Vivas sometimes won't split too well, so uh, you'll just have to try it and see what works for you. So I got my dubbing loop kind of open there you can do a traditional dubbing loop if you want but this is just the quickest method for me so I keep it open with my finger I'll come in and I'll put three pinches of this dubbing kind of in there and I'm not using very much that's kind of my first pinch I'm gonna get it in there about the halfway point push it up there second one and one more Oop, the second one came out so once I kind of have them in there, then I'll move them around, kind of separate them out, try and space it out a little bit, keep the marabou out of it. And I'll kind of hold that back and just spin. The benefit of doing this is you can just spin your bobbin um, unless you have like a, if you're using like a right bobbin or one of the one arm bobbins uh, that aren't balanced, uh, it'll wobble pretty good on you. So, um, you know, I'm just using the standard Dr. Slick one for this, a shorty. So we got our, our dubbing loop here. Uh, we got it spun up pretty well. So I'm gonna come in, wrap back on the tail, and just wrap that right up to right behind the eyes like that. And the more like not pretty it looks, the better it'll fish. So uh, don't worry about getting it just right. Same thing again, I'm gonna come in with one more rubber leg doubled over, snip it at the bottom so you have two again, 
Same thing again, set it right behind the eyes, right at the midpoint. I'll do it on the side closer to you guys. Pinch that down. Two or three wraps right on the side there. Take this front facing section, pull it over and wrap back on top of it like so. And you have another set of legs on each side like that. And I'll come in and just dub just a little bit of this stuff traditionally. So I'll just kind of squeeze some of this stuff on the hook. It doesn't like to dub super well, but you can get old enough. And all this is trying to do is just to keep those legs swept back. That's all we're looking at trying to do with this. So I'm going to pull all of these up now and kind of snip them to the same length as the shortest one. I'm going to come in front of the eyes now, and this is where we're going to put our next marabou plume. Although on this one, like I said at the beginning, we'll use these two because we have kind of two tips there. This will make one, one pretty good wing. So I'm going to push these together right on top of the fly here and I want it to overlap the tail by a little bit but not too much just a little bit set those right on top kind of hold them there and especially with two just give them a soft wrap and then wrap those in like so these front facing pieces if you're not careful you can uh, leave a lot of stuff to crowd your hook eye which we don't want to do so one little trick I'll tell you is to pull these back wrap in front of them like that to kind of prop those up and then it's really easy to get your sharp scissors in there and cut those like that and then our hook eye is still clean there that we can see um, and you can come in and kind of clean all this up wrap over those bind those down if you have any little stragglers in there you can cut those off and the last thing we're going to do is to come in with a little bit more of this dubbing and we're going to make like a little overwing with some of this dubbing. I try and get a, one of those rubber legs or two of them as, in here. Let me try and get another couple closer to this out because we don't want much. It's just like doing the, the gill accent on the lunch money that we were doing before. Uh, so we just want a little bit of this stuff on here. So there's our wing like that. I'm going to set it right on top, right at the hook eye. Kind of stroke that down. Again, soft wrap, soft pinch wrap to lock that in. And take this front facing piece, double it back over, pull it tight. Wrap over it like so. Make your thread head and then come in and you can snip all these fibers out. Now you can come in with your whip finisher. Give it one or two good whip finishes. Lock that in. Snip that off. And again, you're always going to have these little like stragglers. Um, if it really bothers you, you can come in with like a cartery tool or something to kind of burn them all off. Um, Again, just come in and anytime I have exposed thread wraps, I'm going to add add some kind of head cement or um, UV resin typically is what I use just because it's the quickest thing that I can get to, to dry out uh, so I don't have to wait on flies to dry. But that's it. That's the carpet bomb. Um, you know, I kind of came up with it for cart, but it, uh, it works really well for... Uh, especially here locally in central Texas where we're typically fishing smaller flies than what you would think for uh, bigger bass, um, especially in some of the creeks and things like that. Uh, makes a pretty good impressionistic kind of crawfish imitation. Covers, covers a lot of your bases. So you have, you know, your sm you can tie it in smaller sizes for, you know, dragonfly nymphs or damselfly nymphs or uh, you know, the, the olive color, especially on a lot of our over shaded creeks, um, get a lot of moss on the bottom, especially in the summer. So crawfish tend to be an olive color to, to blend in. Um, so yeah, that, this is kind of the straight olive brown color. Um, probably the most popular one that I do, but I like this kind of copper chrome color a lot too with these. 
Uh, this is more of a bassy color with that. Those, uh, these are Senyo's fusion legs. They have some kind of chrome built into them. So, um, adds a little bit of sparkle on the fly. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty good pattern. Um, it's one that I enjoy fishing a lot. Um, I'm throwing this usually on like a three X liter, um, with, uh, you know, eight pound fluorocarbon, something like that. Uh, Chrissy said, caught my personal best bass on a carpet bomb on Barton Creek. That's awesome. That's so cool. I love hearing that. Um, I haven't fished Barton in a long time. Uh, I keep forgetting it's like right there. Um, it's not very far from me. So yeah, that's the carpet bomb. Um, you know, you can do some variations of it. I do variations where I only do, you know, one set of legs in the back instead of two, but I leave them the full length so they're a little bit longer. Um, and then to kind of do a two tone. So we'll, you know, like an olive wing and a, and a, or an olive tail and a brown over wing or something like that. Um, so mix it up, you know, try out some different combinations, see, see what works well for you. Um, it's a, it's a really simple pattern. Um, if you're not familiar with doing dubbing loops, it's a good way to kind of, to kind of get into doing those because I tie a lot of dubbing loops, um, on a lot of my carp and bass stuff just to, uh, give it that kind of buggy effect. So, you know, you can use again, like soft tackle chickaboo. Um, I like it a lot with this super boo too. Um, this is kind of a tan color that works pretty good. Um, and then your standard kind of grizzly chickaboo on the smaller sizes mostly, uh, is what I would use, uh, something like this on it. Um, trying to get a big enough feather. Um, you could probably make it work for about a size eight or so, but a size six would definitely be pushing it. But, uh, chickaboo, definitely a good option. Uh, but the next fly I'm going to do, um, chickaboo definitely works really well for. So let me put some of this stuff away and we'll do a Rio getter for the next one, which is a fly I came up with. I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, fishing here in Central Texas, but we actually have, we have, as far as I'm aware, it's the only uh, cichlid species native to North America. Uh, it's the Rio Grande cichlid. It's not actually native to right here where I'm at. Um, it's native to the Rio Grande drainage uh, a couple hours south of here, but uh, it's been introduced to Central Texas, does really well. Um, a lot of fun to fish. Uh, they're crazy looking too. Uh, Google Google picture of the Rio Grande cichlid. You can kind of see what I'm talking about. They're kind of this brownish gray color and then they just have turquoise spots just kind of all over them. Um, they're, uh, they're a lot of fun to fish for, but they can be fairly picky and they have a uh, fairly small mouth. So um, the Rio Gitter actually was one that I came up with first and the carpet bomb kind of came from it. So it's it's kind of the originator of it. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in just a little so you guys can see this one. I'm going to do it in a size 10. Um, let me try something real quick. Hopefully I don't break everything. Let's see how that looks. Well, I'm going to have to let's, let's stay zoomed out. not as good as I'd hoped. Um, it's gonna have a little bit of trouble focusing on this one, I think, cause it's smaller. Um, yeah, it's really trying. I thought I had the autofocus off. Actually, one sec. Can't tell if that's better or worse. The Facebook compression really hurts on smaller flies like this too. Uh, Rick, I live uh, in downtown Austin, uh, so I'm fishing um, the Lano a lot, Brushy Creek, a lot of the other creeks that we have, um, places like that, uh, simply where I'm, I'm fishing the most. Uh, sorry, I don't have a little better view of this one. The, uh, it looks really good on my side, and then you look at the Facebook side, and it, the compression makes it look pretty bad, but we'll get through it. 
So this is the Rio Getter, same idea. It's only got one set of legs, and the body on this one's uh, the body on this one's actually a wrap instead of uh, dubbing. Uh, but you can tie it a bunch of different ways. So we're gonna do a size 10 uh, in kind of a orangish kind of crawl color. This is a Gamakatsu B10S for it. taking it out oh it's right in front of me uh, so I downsized my thread for these so I'm using this is 12 aught uh, 12 aught Vivas in a, in a rusty brown color Rick says you're, oh you're on the Na Noasis last week that's a awesome river I haven't been down there in a really long time but Hope to get down there sometime soon. That and the Sabinaw and the Frio, um, all those really close to each other, all fish really well, all have super clear water, so um, they can be pretty tough to fish. So again, just starting a little thread bump there. We're gonna tie on some brass eyes just to weight this one. Uh, this is a, these are size small in a gold. So, I'm going to wrap over those and underneath. You can't pull as hard with this thread because it will definitely break on you. That's the, the basic starting out. Uh, so, the last one I tied with a uh, space soft tackle chickaboo. This is actually from the Brahma line. So this is a Brahma soft tackle chickaboo. So we're going to use these feathers up here for the tail and the wing this one um, these down here make really good kind of collar feathers on bigger nymphs and carp flies and stuff like that so we'll find two of these feathers that are in good shape and the Rios don't have a very big mouth um, you'll probably see that when you if you google it or if you happen to catch some um, so 10 is actually pretty big uh, for them, but it shows up a lot easier uh, for you guys um, So we'll do a 10 and I'll tell you to fish fish a, a, a 12 or a 14 typically I like darker colors um, For these so I tie like an olive brown one um, And then a black and olive one uh, is typically what I'm I'm tying these on so this is going to be very, very similar to the carpet bomb, just a little bit different. Um, so you'll see on this particular feather, this section right here is kind of already busted off. So I'm going to come up with my scissors and just cut that tip out of there because it's uneven. Um, this is fairly even, but what you can do anytime you kind of have an uneven uh, feather kind of like this, just come in with your fingernail and just pull up those edges with your fingernail and it looks a lot more natural than when you cut it with your scissors you don't have as uh, as flat as a flat of an edge you kind of still uh, have that taper to it so again this is going to be about as long as the hook shank we come in just wrap that back shorter tail I keep everything fairly short on these because um, the Rios especially will come over um, if they don't like a fly they will come over pick it up by the tail or something and uh, like move it to another spot instead of eating it so keeping it um, keeping everything fairly short on here is a good key to get them to actually pick up the whole fly in their mouth instead of just picking up by the legs or the uh, tail uh, will give you a lot better uh, success rate usually. We're going to tie in some uh, wire. This is just ultra wire and a uh, hot orange. Just a little bit of that. And we're going to wrap this all the way back. Similar to the carpet bomb. Got a tail kind of like that. This one we dub traditionally, so this is uh, some Whitlock SLF in a brown stone color that I'm going to dub this. And it doesn't take much, just a little bit. 
We want a kind of a slightly tapered body if we can get it. Dub some of that on there. Try and make it a little bit of taper. You can always come back and add more. It's just hard to take it off once it's on there. I'm going to pull that tail out and kind of wrap that up like so. And you have kind of a slightly tapered body with that and then just for durability and for kind of color I'll come in and counter wrap this orange wire like so. Anytime you're cutting wire don't do it like I did there and use the tip of your scissors use the backs of them and they'll last a whole lot longer. Uh, so these are this package is totally beat up but these are Grizzly micro legs. Uh, so they're kind of half the size of um, Grizzly, the regular silly legs. So you get a lot more movement out of these. So this is one that I've already cut in half. This is the fluorescent orange color. I'm going to cut it in half again. So now we have two quarters of a leg. And again, just like the carpet bomb, right on top of the eyes on the near or far side of the hook. I'm going to try and do it on the far side where you guys can see it a little bit better. Far side, pinch wrap, another couple pinch wraps to lock that in. Take these front facing ones, that guy up there where he's supposed to be, pull over the top of the hook and back over to the other side, like so. And we're going to leave these fairly short, so I'm going to pull all those up and then cut them about like that. I'll readjust them here in a second once we dub a little bit more in there to keep those legs nice and, and swept back. Uh, so I'm going to pull those back like so, kind of dub that in there. Those are still just a little long. I'm going to cut in and cut them like that. Give the fish less to pick up on the fly uh, if it wants to move it. And then there's that's going to be our wing. Um, so if I'm going to come in and kind of bust the, the tip out. So I just have the, these fibers here, like so. Set that right on top. Move our thread up to our hook eye first, getting ahead of ourselves. Pinch that there, soft wrap, another soft wrap. Tie that in like so. And again, just like we do on the carpet bomb, if you're worried about crowding your hook eye, just lift up that feather a little bit, give it a few wraps in front, and then that'll prop it up enough usually to be able to come in with your scissors and snip that uh, closer than you would be able to otherwise. And just bind all that stuff down, make a nice kind of fairly neat thread head. Whip finish. Again, this is a size 10. If I was fishing for Rio Grand Cichlid specifically, I would be throwing an, a 12, if not a 14, usually. Um, they just tend to gravitate toward these smaller flies. Uh, but for sunfish and creek bass, and uh, I've caught plenty of trout on this fly, um, you know, imitate your naturals, go to the same size, um, and just come up with whatever um, that's kind of a, a rusty kind of craw color that I tie uh, we have a lot of these kind of like nickel and or so size crawfish um, when they hatch that are around kind of that color um, in the hill country especially like on the Lano and places like that so a uh, pretty good color option for um, fishing around there uh, I got through the three patterns a little bit quicker than I anticipated, so um, happy to answer any questions you guys have about these or um, commercial tying or anything like that. Um, Tanner says Rio Gitters also work on carp. They do. The only problem with this hook specifically, um, once you get below a size 8 in a B10S, the wire gauge shrinks substantially, so... Um, they do like to 
uh, if you hook a you know double digit carp on this hook, it going to take some finesse to be able to get that in otherwise the hook is going to usually break if not your tip at first so um it's a good good little fly something i always have in my box around here probably the i mean these three that i tied are the if i could go fish anywhere in central texas with these i could go catch fish um pretty confident about that and it wouldn't i could go catch i would probably say I could catch pretty much any species of fish on these three flies that we have in Central Texas. So um, if you're looking to kind of build up a pretty versatile box, uh, think about something like that. Um, you know, I, uh, I make the mistake that a lot of us make probably and end up on the river with, you know, 10,000 flies of all different sizes and shapes and end up fishing the same flies, you know, same six to 12 patterns and a couple of different colors and sizes more often than not so um sometimes it's fun just to see about what little you can get away with uh frank says three flies i'll have in my fly box from now on thanks uh frank really appreciate it thanks so much uh feel free to reach out if you have questions about tying any of them there are videos that i've done on these on youtube on these three patterns so um and then you can always come back to the whiting page and uh and watch uh uh, the video here because it'll be on their page now so uh, anyway uh, I'm going to sign off a little early I guess um, again my name is Matt Bennett uh, you can find me on Instagram at, at @flygeekmatt. Matt uh, here on Facebook at Fly Geek Custom Flies uh, thanks very much to Whiting for giving me the opportunity to, to tie some flies for you guys uh, love Whiting Farms products and their feathers and uh, great people that work there also so Hope you guys enjoyed it and have a good evening.